Well, a big welcome from North Wales, you all, from in Germany, in Holland, in, uh, in Toronto, uh, Shirley Zagab in, in Toronto there, big welcome to you because you've got a big celebration uh, this, this, this evening and tomorrow. And uh, welcome to you uh, uh, to, uh, in the UK as well, everybody here in Wales and all of you in the rest of England and also some of you in Scotland and Ireland maybe tonight. So a, a very big welcome to you all and uh, I hope that you enjoy this evening. But a couple of things I want to say first is to advertise the um, the celebration that Shirley has uh, in Toronto uh, this evening and it's, um, it, it's the celebration of Israel's uh, Day of Independence. It's Yom Ha'atzimut. I think uh, I don't think I pronounced that correctly, but Jill Walker and Ed, if they're watching, will be able to tell me if I have or I haven't. Or, but um, uh, there's a big celebration uh, tonight in in uh, Toronto, and I've got a, a poster. You can get onto that celebration for Israel uh, Independence Day uh, celebrations tonight at seven o'clock, um, and I've got the Zoom link. It's on Zoom. Uh, you won't be able to see it until two o'clock in the morning because of the time difference. And Shirley will be leading this um, celebration. Uh, but if you're around at two o'clock in the morning, uh, then that's great. Now, if you email me uh, straight after this uh, presentation, then I'll send you this link and the password and the Zoom identification to get on to that celebration. But that is at two o'clock in the morning for those of you in who are in the UK. It might be later on, I think, you, Ralph, is it? And, uh, and Vilma in Ho Holland, uh, I don't know, but probably four o'clock in the morning. But anyway, if you want to join that, please do and join Shirley as she leads that celebration. But we are uh, looking at Hidden Treasure Module 2 tonight. And this module follows on from one in the sense that we build the course on principles and the principle is that God gave the land to the Jewish people as we saw last week. There is no question about it. He gave them the land of Israel as an everlasting possession. And just to refresh, uh, we'll remember that actually the land isn't just what we see today of modern Israel. The land actually is up as far as the Euphrates River on the east of uh, Jerusalem, a long way east of Jerusalem. And that incorporates uh, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, Syria, parts of Egypt as it is today. So it's, it's a big piece of land. And of course, Jordan, which was uh, uh, created in 1925 uh, as uh, Transjordan. So it's a big piece of land. And tonight we're looking at the people who God asks to dwell in that land and to keep his Torah, his laws in that land, to be a sign to the rest of the world, a light to the rest of the world, that there is one God. And he's, he called Abraham from Chaldeans, uh, which is actually in modern day Iraq. And he called him to be the father of many nations. And we're going to look at that whole subject tonight. And we're going to look at some of the things as well that are, are that uh, most Jewish people practice today um, biblically so that we can gain some respect, not only for the people, but also the religious and biblical practices. And the reason I put this in is because um, when I first came into my faith uh, as a, as a believer in Yeshua, I heard other Christians speaking derogatorily about Jews and the things that they did wearing ringlets, et cetera, et cetera. So I wanted to introduce this into the course so that we could have actually a respect for what the Jewish people do and not, uh, not vilify them for what they do. So, and in fact, we do a lot of the things that the Jewish people do as well. So, um, we're going to look at that tonight as well. But I want to introduce you as well to, to something which is uh, quite a horrible um, uh, philosophy within Christianity. And that is that the church, the, the Gentile church in particular, has replaced Israel. And, um, and actually the teaching in some churches that Israel doesn't have a right to the land and that the Jews don't have a right to live there because God has finished with the Jews. 
Well, we're going to look at what God says about the Jews tonight, but uh, some of these philosophies within Christendom are taught by various uh, teachers in the replacement theology world, and, and one of them is a, 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 a retired Anglican minister called Stephen Sizer, and Stephen Sizer has written a number of books that actually vilify Christian Zionists like you and I, and, uh, and say actually that we've got the, the Bible wrong. Um, other people like uh, uh, Garth Hewitt, who is another Christian leader, is also supporting uh, Stephen Sizer with this philosophy, and it's 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 a, it's, it's false. Uh, it's a false doctrine that it actually does damage to Israel. Um, what Garth Hewitt says, as a as a um, uh, on the back of the book, he says Stephen Sizer shows that many Christians are espousing views that they claim come from the Bible but which are in fact leading to bloodshed, dispossession and division in the Middle East. He calls for a more careful look at the Bible that reflects the call of Jesus to be peacemakers or the followers of Jesus to be peacemakers. Well, we're going to look at whether Sizer is right biblically or whether we're right biblically uh, tonight about the Jewish people because um, what people who... Uh, teach replacement theology creates is an atmosphere in which uh, Palestinian Arabs who live in the land and have lived in the land for many years as well uh, um, uh, feel that they have the church on their side and, um, and and are actually fueled by this debate. If the church would only tell the truth to um, to the Arab uh, people in Israel that actually God says it's there, it's the land belonging to the Jews, and the Jews are God's chosen people. If they could understand that, maybe they wouldn't be um, in, a, in, in a situation where they would want to throw the Jews out of the land and destroy them altogether. So, so this teaching that we do here tonight is really important because we can pass that on and we can actually refute the claims of people like Sizer and others, uh, Garth Hewitt and many others as well, Jeremy Moody. Uh, other Christian leaders who teach this false doctrine of replacement theology. So, so I'm going to open up the PowerPoint presentation, which you can't see, but which I use as, as notes um, uh, during this part, this uh, uh, internet course that the first one actually we've done. We've done many courses all over the all over the country and all over Europe as well, and uh, in Belarus. Oh, in, in small groups using the PowerPoint for them, but um, uh, we can't do that tonight because because we're live streaming. So the question tonight is, who are the Jews? And you, in your manual, you will see that, uh, the, that we're going to look at the scriptures regarding that. Jews have wandered throughout the world for 2,000 years. They've no king. They are hidden under the national name of the country of their residence because they live in, in countries throughout the world and actually um, uh, uphold the laws and the governments in each country. And, and in fact, here, and I'm sure it's in every other part of the world, but, but in, in synagogues on Sabbath, they often pray for their leaders here in the synagogues in in uh, the UK, they always pray for the royal family, the queen, and for the government. Very, very faithful and loyal people, which can't be said of some people uh, in these countries in any case. So what does God say about the people? We need to know what actually God says, not what we say, not what our thoughts are. But what does God say? Because he's the one who who is the important person here with regard to the Jewish people, because he has called them to be his servants. So let's have a look how he describes them and what he says about them. And so if, you, if you've got your manual there, you'll see that the first scripture we're going to look at is Exodus 4, 22. And I'm going to read that uh, for as normally as I've said before, we, I usually ask other people to read and um, and then we discuss the scripture, but we can't do that in this case. Verse 22, then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. What a 
what a statement to begin with, right at the outset when when God is telling Moses to tell Pharaoh, listen, these people are my firstborn son. What are what are the uh, what are the things that are important about a firstborn son? That's the question I'm going to ask you. If we take our royal family, the firstborn son has the inheritance. They take the inheritance. And in fact, in biblical times, there was a double portion. And sometimes there is uh, in, in royal families throughout the world. The firstborn is the inheritance, a really important place to, to, to be in. Um, so let, let's have a look at Deuteronomy 7, verse 6. While I'm looking, you can, it gives you a chance to look as well, doesn't it? For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. Well, that, that's where we get the name for the course from, the hidden treasures. But, but he says, God has chosen Israel out of all the peoples of the earth to be his people his treasured possession. Now, I want us to think back, many of us who came from a traditional church background, who would never understand this scripture being uh, focused upon the Jewish people today. But, but it is, it's, it's not for the church, traditional churches in Germany, Holland, or Netherlands, or Canada, or the UK, this is about the Jewish people, his treasured possession. Now, I want to ask you, what's the most treasured thing that you have? Probably your husband, your wife, your children, parents. Uh, they're, they're, they're really important, aren't they? And you have other treasures as well, I'm sure. So as some of you may have real riches and, uh, and great wealth. But, but I think... Uh, our treasures are really the people that are, are dearest to us. And, um, and, and this is how God sees the Jewish people. They're, tr they're his treasured possession. But also he, he, he owns them. They're his. And that's really important for us to understand. We can't go uh, poking at the Jewish people because they, they're God's precious possession. He 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 owns them. He he owns everything anyway, doesn't he? But he makes a point of saying this. Now let's go to Deuteronomy 14. And I'm reading from the Revised Standard Version. And it's just one thing I, uh, I wanted to mention again. I did mention it last week, but that some of the verses might be different in uh, the Netherlands with you, Vilmer, uh, uh, and, and Koos, your husband. You might find that the verses are different, as you said in an email uh, today to me and also I don't know whether you've got the same situation in Canada or with your translations or uh, you in Ralph and Siegfried in Germany but but these are the verses that we have here so maybe you can just uh, move either side of that and, uh, and, and, and follow through with what I'm reading so 14 verse 2 says for you are a people Holy to the Lord your God, it is you the Lord has chosen out of all the peoples on the earth, people to be his treasured possession. He's, God is repeating this to, uh, to the reader. And when God repeats something, he means it. He means it anyway, doesn't he? But he's repeating this so that we will really understand that the Jewish people are God's treasured possession. And... Um, What's interesting for me here, he says, for you are a people holy to the Lord. Holiness means separation from the world. So they're, they're, they're separate from the rest of the world. They're, they're special to God. 1 Chronicles 16.13. What we're doing here and what we do with the whole of the course really is to set principles in place based on the word of God. 
So really, there's no argument, and uh, Mr. Sizer and his other uh, colleagues here will find these hard to refute. 16.13. O offspring of his servant Israel, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. Well, this makes it abundantly clear that Israel, and Israel is the sons of Jacob, and we're going to look at those, and particularly next week, we're going to look at the 12 tribes of Israel. God says that they're his servants. Now, the, the word possession in the last verse makes more uh, of a, an understanding for this idea of servanthood because you own a servant very often. People in, in the times, the biblical times, certainly own a servant and, and, and they own slaves. And you see the word slaves in scripture very often, but it's not our understanding of slaves that uh, God means in these scriptures. The slaves in the Hebrew times, in the times of the, 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 the Bible here, were, were actually people who were looked after and cared for. And they often loved their master and their master loved their servants. And so this is the understanding key. And God says they're his servant. Now, they actually um, have a, a job to do for God, and that is to point the world to the one true God. And we're going to look at that a bit further on. And he makes it clear that they are the sons of Jacob, not the sons of Ishmael, the sons of Jacob. And we're going to look at some of that uh, this week and next week and look at the, the differences there. So we're looking at the sons of Jacob, who were the 12 tribes of Israel. And he says they're his chosen ones. So really important, the principle of God's um, word is clear to us that it's in regard to the people of Israel being special, chosen, treasured possession. But let's move to Psalm 105. Let's have a look at the Psalms now and what uh, David spoke about the Jewish people and his people. Let's have a look. It's Psalm 105, 6, and then we'll go to verse 43 from that. So. 105, Mr. Page there. Verse 6 says, O offspring of his servant Abraham, children of Jacob, his cho chosen ones. So it's clear again, it's repeating the same story that his chosen ones are the um, sons of Jacob, who was, the, who was the grandson of Abraham, who was called from the Chaldeans. So, so God is making it very clear. We can't get mixed up here between Ishmael or the Gentiles. This is specifically the Jewish people. And let's move to verse 43 now of Psalm 105. I think I've lost it there. So he brought his people out with joy, his chosen ones with singing. This is how God feels about the Jewish people. He brought his people. Now we know who they are. The Jewish people are the, the uh, sons of Jacob and their descendants right down, right down to today. So the Jews today are descendants of the sons of Jacob, the 12 tribes. And, uh, and God says he brought them out of Egypt with joy. You can, you can look at the story of the prodigal son, how when the prodigal son returns home after being in the wilderness, actually being in the world, and his father makes a banquet for him, there's real enjoyment. There's, it, the, the, the father's heart is full of joy. And that's how God feels. And it's uh, exactly the same uh, understanding when when here uh, God says his he brings them out with his chosen ones with singing he's he's joyful what do you do when you're joyful you sing can you imagine Israel coming back at, coming out of Egypt and then God singing over them and just it's just a wonderful picture you, you imagine 
what what happens in the heavenly realms when when Jews today go back home to to Israel, the land that we spoke about last week, and which God promised them as an everlasting possession. There's singing and, and joy in the heavenlies. I'm sure that's the case. So we understand that it being very, very special. Um, so <clears throat> let's have a look at the next scripture. And we'll stay with the Psalms 106 verse 5. I don't know why I've lost my page again. There we are, I've got it again. That I may see, this is David saying to God, that I may see the prosperity of your chosen ones. So David understands that he is king over the chosen ones of God. That I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation. David says that, that, God's nation, Israel is God's nation. It, it, it's God's nation. And I think if we can get that message over to the church, uh, definitely to the church and then to the governments, then actually Israel is God's nation. I think the world would look at this quite, the question of Israel quite differently and the question of the Jewish people quite differently if that message could be understood by, um, by everybody. And then, and, and David says, then I may glory in your heritage. David understands that the Jewish people are God's heritage. What's your heritage? Is that special to you? Absolutely it is. It's, it's, our heritage is special to all of us. So let's move to Psalm 135, verse 4. I know you may find this a little bit repetitive, but I, I, I want to make it very, very clear what God thinks about the Jewish people. And in each one of these verses, we can look at, in different ways uh, uh, as to how God feels about them. And, and uh, he certainly writes about them in different ways and gives them different names and, and different uh, uh, views of how he feels about them. So 135 verse 4. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel has his, has his own possession. Well, we're going to look next week at this question of, um, of, of Jacob's sons. But, but we know, don't we, that Jacob was renamed the Jabok River. Uh, his his na new name was Israel. And that name, as we mentioned last week, means God prevails. So um, we can understand that when God chose, chose uh, Jacob, he had the intention that the Jewish people would prevail. And then he goes on in verse 4, Israel as his own possession. So David is saying that Israel is the possession of God, as we've seen in Scripture. Very, very powerful Scriptures, these. Let's go to Isaiah 41, 8 and 9. But you, all Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called, called from its father's corner, father's corner, saying to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. And if you go on to verse 10, it says, do not fear for I am with you. But he says, I have chosen. This word chosen continually comes up in scripture about the nation of Israel. So let's look at Isaiah 44, verse 1. But now hear, O Jacob. God is speaking to Jacob and to, to the grandson of Abraham, who's representing the whole of Israel. But now here, so when God says that, you've got to prick your ears up. And, and God wants Jacob to know s some things about his, his uh, position in society, in, in, in the world. He says, but now here, oh, Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. 
I think most of the Jewish people actually know that they are a chosen people. I think they, they know the scriptures. They know what God says about them. Our problem is the rest of the world don't know that. And that's why we teach these courses. And, and, uh, and that's why we have uh, uh, people who have taught these things for centuries really, trying to get the message in to the rest of the world because the rest of the world don't like the idea of Israel being chosen, but God does. He's chosen for a purpose and uh, we're trying to get that message out on behalf of Israel to the church. So the next scripture is Isaiah 40, um, sorry, is Isaiah 65 verse 9. Now Isaiah, we'll look at in the end session, is a, 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 a prophet to comfort Israel. And um, he certainly does that. He, he gives hope and, and uh, expectation for the Jewish people. And that's his position as a prophet. So we're looking at Isaiah 65, verse 9. I will bring forth descendants from Jacob and from Judah, inheritors of my mountain. My chosen shall inherit it, shall inherit it and my servants shall settle there. This is full of expectation for the Jewish people because he says, I will bring my descendants, sorry, forth descendants from Jacob, so we're looking at, at all the Jewish people and from Judah, who is the, the son, one of the 12 sons. And Judah is the, for us, he's the line that Yeshua comes from. And David comes from this line. And from Judah, inheritors of my mountain. So God is saying that, that, that the tribe of Judah, one of the 12 tribes, will inherit the mountains of, of Israel, my mountains, and he's talking about Jerusalem here, really. And God is making it very clear that the tribe of Judah actually inherit the, the, the mountains around Jerusalem, and we know what the importance is of Jerusalem from last week, don't we? So, so this is very clear that actually the tribe of Judah actually have possession of those mountains, and when we look um, at the inheritance of the land and the proportions of the land, in next week's session, we see that Judah does have a possession, is given possession of Judea and Samaria, the, the area in, in which Jerusalem is central. And, um, and God makes it clear here, my chosen shall inherit it and my servants shall settle there. It, it, it's not the land that belongs to the Palestinian Arabs. It's not that land at all. It's land, Jerusalem, a city, and the mountains, all that area, which is which is today is known as the West Bank, is actually Judea and Samaria, and is owned by the Jewish people. Ultimately, God, but He gives it to them as as an everlasting possession. Now let's move to Zechariah two verse eight. Because this is a, a, an important scripture too. It's probably the, the most well-known scriptures in regard to the Jewish people and, and what God says about them. So he says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, after his glory sent me regarding the nations that plundered you, the nations who plundered Israel, and they have, haven't they, over the centuries, truly one who touches you touches the apple of my eye the apple of his eye is are the jewish people and you know what, what it would be like if someone poked you in the eye it's the it's the central point of your sight it's everything you see and and the pupil it's 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 very very soft and precious and and, and and very painful if you were to touch it down and god says you know it, it, he who touches Israel touches the apple of my eye, the center of my eye, the pupil, the, the, the very, very focus of what I see on earth. It's very clear that God has his eye on, on the Jewish people. 
And we need to have our eye on the Jewish people to understand the end times and understand what's happening spiritually. We have to look at the Jewish people and what God is doing with them today. And he's gathering them back, isn't he? And, and that's what we look at in session six. We look uh, at the Jewish people going back home. But, but that's what God has in, in his focus. And that's what we should be looking at is the Jewish people. And God says, don't touch them. He warns the nations not to touch them. Now let's move to Malachi 3.17. Okay, if you found it now, God says through Malachi about the Jewish people, he says, they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, my special possession. On the day when I act, I will spare them as parents spare their children who serve them. What an amazing scripture. God says they're his special possession, which we've seen, but he says they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. My special possession on the day when I act, I will spare them as parents spare their children who serve them. You know, those of you who've got children, how special it is um, and how important they are to you and how you feel about them. And of course, they will be spared. The Jewish people will be spared. In our theology, we understand that I believe that Yeshua, when Yeshua comes back, he comes back to redeem the Jewish people and totally protect them and he avenges them so uh, he he he, uh, uh, he punishes the world for how they dealt with the jewish people he, he comes back as their protector without doubt so the, the jewish people are very special to god we've looked at the scriptures in regard to that and now we want to look at the question of inheritance again and I mentioned last week the Newsy documents, didn't I? And, and, and let's have a look at this question of inheritance, because much is said of the inheritance of the land of Israel, particularly when uh, addressing the sons of both Abraham and Isaac. We see in scripture that God makes it very clear that the inheritance goes from I, Abraham to Isaac and then to Jacob through the 12 tribes of Israel, giving spiritual authority of the land directly to the tribe of Judah, and, and that's in Genesis 49. So we, we, we will look at that next week in more detail, but it's clear that the inheritance of the land goes back to the Jewish people. And, and I think as you know, and I know that when the Jewish people are not living on the land, the land is desolate. When they're living on the land, it blooms and blossoms. We spoke about that last week, didn't we? But there is a conflict that's taking place in the spiritual realm that works out in the physical realm and has always done since Jacob, the time of Jacob. And that is the conflict between Israel and Eden. Eden being the sons of Ishmael. Now, the nation of Israel is descended from Jacob. The nation of Eden is descended from Esau. And we see that in Genesis 25, 23. Now, the Lord told Rebekah that there were two nations in her womb and that two peoples will be separated. That's, the, that's um, uh, Jacob and Esau. And we see that in Genesis 25, 19 to 26. You've got all these references in your manual, so we won't read them all tonight, but we, I'll, I'll refer to them and then you can follow that through in your manual. Now, Esau sold his birthright of blessing to Jacob. And we see that in Numbers 20, 14 to 22. And we looked at the Newsy documents, didn't we, last week? We mentioned it, and I, I, I think some of you will have read that. I know you, Vilma, read that, uh, and, and that's something which was new for you. I hope that uh, all of you managed to read the, the story in the Newsy documents, which is in the manual. And the birthright was sold, and it was uh, it was the uh, social norm at the time, but it's also a biblical command. 
So oh, sorry. So the, the the scriptures there is Genesis twenty five twenty nine to thirty four. Esau selling his birthright, and then we have Numbers twenty fourteen to twenty two. It shows us that Edom refused to allow Israel to pass through the land, even though Israel just wanted to go through the, the, the land without taking anything from Esau. Esau didn't want them to go through. And still, since that time, Israel's kings have had a constant conflict with Edom. And, and I'll just mention some of the scriptures. We see in 1 Samuel 14, 47, that Saul was constantly battling with the sons of Ishmael, with Edom. There was, there was constant warring because Edom didn't want to give Israel any peace. David in 2 Samuel 8, 13 to 14, we see in 2 Samuel 8 that David was battling with, again, Edom. But David uh, overcame Edom and actually went and restored the land back to the Euphrates River, as far back as that, because Edom had taken the land illegally, if you like, or non-biblically. And, uh, and we see that happening today, don't we, that the land is being taken. Jordan now is, is living on a piece of land which is actually Israel's own. There should be Jews living there. Uh, and, the, and there would have been, except for the British government, and um, who, who created Transjordan and then eventually it became Jordan. And actually, it was created so the Palestinian Arabs could live there. But, but biblically, it, it, that piece of land is Israel's. Solomon in 1 Kings 11, 14 to 22, again, battles with Eden. Jehoram in 2 Kings 8, 20 to 22, and 2 Chronicles 21 to 8. Ahaz had battles, 2 Chronicles 28, 16. Edom also urged Babylon to destroy Jerusalem. And we see that in Psalm 137, 7. So Edom, the sons of Ishmael, would, wanted Babylon, the Babylonians, to destroy the, the city of Jerusalem. Has anything changed? Still, um, the, the, the Arab nations want to destroy Jerusalem and actually want to create their own um, city there. Genesis 25, 27 describes Esau as a cunning hunter. Now, we mustn't get this wrong. Nimrod was described as a cunning hunter as well. But it, what it means is one who is mighty against God, not somebody who was fighting for God or hunting on behalf of God. He was actually fighting uh, a God and mighty against God. That's what it means. Jacob, however, is called plain, and this word means pious or upright or undefiled. It doesn't mean he's plain in terms of not interesting. It means that this man was pious, upright, and or undefiled. He was a, a righteous man, a man of God, whereas Esau is described as a cunning hunter. So now I, I want to... Um, Finish with those scriptures regarding uh, Israel and Edom being in conflict. But I, before I move from that, I just want you to think a little bit about that continuance of that battle taking place in our generation today in Israel. And we're going to look at some of those things a bit later on. But this is at a point where I just mentioned the Jews in in the UK and how they came to be in the UK. And I just want to mention, and because we're speaking about Jews now, uh, you may, uh, surely you may know in, in Canada, how the Jews came to Canada. Ralph, uh, in Germany, you will know about that. And uh, Vilma, you will know uh, how they came to be in the Netherlands, although that's not so clear. I've studied all these areas and it's not generally so clear as to uh, when Jews arrived uh, in Holland or Netherlands and in Germany, the exact dates. But uh, one book to uh, really examine is uh, uh, Martin Gilbert's History of the Jewish People. That's a really good history. And uh, I've got a, another book of the Jewish people edited by Ben Sasson, uh, another good book. And they give reasonable dates as to the history of the Jews and when they arrived in different countries. But, but I'm just going to uh, mention the UK. 
first of all. The first Jewish people settled in the, the UK in 1066 in London, and we know that from the Doomsday Book. In 1075, Jews settled in Oxford. In 1290, the Jews were expelled from the UK, and at that time, the Jewish population was just 3,000. Now, the first record of Jews, as I said, was found in the Doomsday Book, but also there were uh, times where Jews were heavily persecuted in the United Kingdom. And uh, there are records of those, such as the York riots, such as the uh, punishments of the Jews uh, by the church council in Oxford, particularly. Uh, there were riots against Jews in London uh, during the time of King Stephen. We're going to look at the blood libel uh, next week, which was created in uh, the UK in 1144. And the blood libel, we'll go into that and mention what that is, but it's a lie against the Jewish people. So they, that during that period between 1066 and 1290 was a period of heavy persecution, which we will look at next week in detail. Now, the Jewish population in the UK um, came back in the 17th century with Oliver Cromwell and, um, and uh, 16th and 17th century saw Jews coming from uh, Europe, from Spain. They came over after the Inquisition, and uh, and they stayed here and remained here and have actually been part of our society, but also inputted amazingly into law, into government. I think one of the most res respected people I, I know in the Jewish community here in the UK is, uh, first of all, it's Joy Wolf, who's president of the Zionist Congress in Manchester, who's an amazing uh, retired, well-retired journalist now, but is a very strong uh, Zionist activist, and she's an amazing woman. But secondly is uh, is uh, a man called Sir uh, Lord Alex Carlyle, who was a barrister in the case that I uh, had many years ago. And uh, he was such a clever man. I've never met such a clever person in all my life. And he's now become Lord Carlyle and actually led the... Uh, um, the government advisory committee on terrorism for many years well-respected man who has the safety of the united kingdom it, deep within his heart he's the, he's the son of a holocaust survivor and uh, he's he's an absolutely amazing man and often he's asked for advice on various matters regarding terrorism and other world affairs and of course another a major theologian in the UK uh, is uh, Jonathan Sachs, an amazing teacher. So I wanted to mention those, though, but I've digressed. Let's get back to the to the course. So the so Jews have been here since the uh, 17th century, 1600s, when Oliver Cromwell came, and uh, and the Jewish population in the UK in 1914, that was at the beginning of the First World War was then 60,000. Now, the overall population in the UK today is of 69 million, but the Jewish population is still only 330,000, and yet they impact our society so much. Two-thirds of the Jews living in the UK live in London, and the other main centres that they live in is uh, Manchester, Leeds, and Glasgow. And, of course, some live in Liverpool, a, a small community in Liverpool. Now, there are approximately 17 million Jews living in the world. That's a guess. Nobody really knows how many, but there's well over 18, 8 million now live in Israel, and they're based on the 2018 figures. I think probably the figures is more like 9 million now. Um, now, 5.8 million Jews live in the States. There's 460,000 in France. There's 550,000 uh, Jews in Russia. A lot have left there to go and live in Israel. There's 400,000 Jews living in the Ukraine. There's 360,000 Jews living in Canada. I think that's right, surely. I think that's, uh, we're pretty sure about that, but I might be wrong. So correct me for next week, please, if I am. Uh, so there's 330,000 living in the UK, as I've said. There's 250,000 living in Argentina. 
a, a lot of Jews went from uh, the, the Europe after the Holocaust to a South American country. So we have this 250,000 in Argentina and then 130,000 in Brazil and 106,000 in South Africa, 100,000 in Australia. So there, there are small communities of Jews because those figures are small in comparison with the population in those countries. So uh, the biggest one is, is America, obviously, other than those in, in Israel. And Israel is, is growing with the numbers of Jews living there. So that gives you a, a rough idea. But there are Jews in every country in the world. In fact, uh, Grace, my daughter, lives in Beijing. There is a, a, a Jewish museum there. And, and people, there's a small Jewish community there. So um, Jews are, are, are living all over the world but are now going back. So who is a Jew and what do they believe? Well, Jews believe that a Jew is someone who is a child of a Jewish mother and who has not adopted another faith. Someone who isn't born a Jew can convert to Judaism. So if you're not born a Jew, you can convert. Judaism means living the faith. And, and, and that really... Um, it's precious, isn't it? That, that actually Jews will live their faith, and, and it, 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 it's something that we kind of lack often in the Christian community. Not everybody, most Christians try and live their faith, but there is an awful lot who just treat the, the faith scantily. But, that's, but Judaism means living the faith. Almost everything a Jewish person does can become an act of worship. The Jewish view of God is Jews brought new ideas about God to the world. As I said when uh, I spoke about Jews being God's servants, their, their job is to not only take the, 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 the Torah, the, the laws of God to the world, but actually teach the world that there, was, that there is only one God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There is no other God. And they're taking that message into a world that was polytheistic, meaning a world that was worshipping many of the gods. And we still do, don't we, uh, in many countries in the world. The Jewish idea of God is particularly important to the world because it was the Jews who developed the idea of one God. And that God chooses to behave in a way that is both just and fair, not like many of the pagan gods. Jews believe that God exists. There is only one God. There are no other gods. God can't be subdivided into different persons, and Jews should worship only one God. And that—that that is the difference, I think, between uh, Christianity as, uh, or Messianic believers today and the Orthodox Jewish community, is that the Orthodox Jewish community believe that there is only one God, and he can't be divided into three persons. And if we look at Isaiah and, uh, and Genesis and other scriptures, we as Christians believe that there is the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, but, uh, and therefore the three uh, persons in one. But the Jewish believe, people believe there is only one God, and, and that's based on the scripture, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. They believe God is transcendent. God is above and beyond all earthly things. There's so many similarities between our two faiths. Well, in fact, we are part of the faith of, of, of the Jews. God doesn't have a body. God can do anything. God is beyond time. God has always existed. God will always exist. Isn't this the message that we understand is true? God is just and God is merciful. God punishes the bad. God rewards the good. God is forgiving towards those who make mistakes. Don't we believe that like the Jewish people believe it? God is personal and accessible. God is interested in each individual and God listens to each individual. God speaks to individuals in different ways. Now, we believe very much the same because it was Jews that taught us our faith. I mean, the, many of the Gentile leaders, as we've seen in week four, 
change the idea of how we practice our faith but but the jewish people actually taught us that there was one god and that 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 god is someone who, who is interested in us as individuals we believe that that yeshua was god is god that he's all one person so it was Yeshua and his disciples that taught us much of what we've just read so the jewish relationship with god is a covenant relationship and jews keep god's laws and god keeps his covenant that he will protect and bless them jews seek to bring holiness into every aspect of their lives that's generally what Jews believe. So we're not a million miles away. And, and I think if Christendom could understand the, the, the things that bring us together, we wouldn't have persecuted them as we have for 2,000 years. We've, we've told lies about them and told uh, uh, people in the world that Jews don't believe in God. And they've not gone to people. Well, that is an absolute lie. We'll look at that in session four, but, but that's what's caused the polarization to take place. Now, there are different Jewish groups that we see in history. You'll see these in your manual that are Pharisees, and we see um, the, the references there. Um, I, I think Yeshua was taught as a Pharisee. Um, the Sadducees, and we see those in, in, in the Gospels. As we see Pharisees, we see teachers of the law. It's another group. Herodians, we see in the New Testament scriptures or the Gospels. We also know that the groups, the Essenes and the Qumran sect, who were uh, 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 communities who lived uh, uh, in the first century, well, first century BC and AD in Israel, um, the Essenes, there was a community of about 4,000 who lived in both Damascus and, and other parts of Israel communities. It, it could be, it looked like Yeshua was in relationship with the Essenes. There was the Qumran community who lived in a place called Qumran, who um, uh, were, were kept the ceremonial laws and didn't like the way that the temple was being run, and, and neither did Yeshua, and, um, by abusive uh, uh, leaders who were appointed by Herod, who ran the temple and, on behalf of the Romans. So there were zealots. Peter was a zealot. They were zealot for the Torah, and that's important for us to know. They were zealous for the laws of God, and, and Yeshua chose Peter because he was zealous for the laws of God. Then we have the Hazardim, who we see today, um, the the, uh, the the Jews who who wear the big hats, and um, some of the, I'm talking about the big fur hats, and that goes back to 16th, 17th century Lithuania. But we see um, the Hazardim who are uh, who who are very, very ultra-Orthodox. We see their community in Meishirim, in Jerusalem, but also all over the world, and particularly in New York. Then we have the Orthodox community, who are the community that we know here in the UK very well. We know many of the Jewish people in Liverpool. We have a relationship with them. And, and uh, uh, in the Manchester community and in the London community, Orthodox Jews who um, who work really well with us here and uh, I have great respect for them and then we have the secular Jews as we do with secular Christians if you like and then there is the, there are the messianic community who are Jews who believe that Yeshua is the Messiah so they are Jews and not Gentiles who believe in Messiah but the Jews who believe in Messiah messianic believe that Yeshua is going to come back and you see those in the book of Acts they were the 3,000 who who uh, were touched by the Holy Spirit um, in, in Acts 2, and, and they're the ones who are now in Israel who are uh, uh, um, growing in their numbers and growing in their uh, communities. So the, the, those particular groups. So we want to move very quickly because we haven't got a lot of time, but we want to move. Why do Jews do certain things? Are they scriptural? Well, you may have seen that Jews wear phylacteries and tefillin, which is something, well, the, the, this is what these are, and they have within them scriptures. Um, and you might see Jews wearing these and, 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 and tying the, um, 
uh, tying uh, leather to their arms. You may have seen that in Israel, but you may see it as well in certain parts of the UK or wherever you live. But this, these tefillim and phylacteries, as they're called, are they scriptural? Because if we can understand that they're scriptural, then we can grow in respect for the Jewish people actually wearing these. We mustn't uh, disrespect them if they are scriptural. So let's have a look. Are they scriptural? The wearing of tefillin begins with the scripture, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. I quoted that earlier on. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your, all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as sim symbols on your hands and bind them on your forehead. And you will see that these are tied to the forehead of uh, uh, ultra-Orthodox Jews in the name. Write them on the door frames of your houses. And you will, you will have seen these. Many of you uh, will be familiar with these. Uh, um, mezu these mezuzahs, uh, and they're placed on the doors of the homes of the Jewish people. And... Um, and God says, write them on the door frames of your houses and put them on your gates. And the scripture is in here, kept in this and placed on the door of the homes of the Jewish people. And, uh, and, and it's admirable that Jews will actually uh, put that uh, display that to show that they respect and love the laws of God. So what about the wearing of tassels? Many of you will have seen uh, Jewish people wearing tassels. Is that scriptural? Certainly the phylactery and the uh, tefillin, that's scriptural. But what about the wearing of tassels? This is a vest that uh, uh, Jewish men wear, and they they wear that under their shirts, and they have the tassels here on the on the side. There's, I've got another vest, and you see it on the prayer shawls as well. You see there's another vest. Um, you see the tassels on the uh, prayer shawls. So let's see if it's scriptural. Well, it is. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, throughout the generations to come, you are to make tassels on the corners of your garments with a blue cord on each tassel. And you can see here there's a blue cord on, on the tassel here. But on, on many people's tassels, there's not a blue cord because uh, they couldn't find for many years, for 2,000 years, they couldn't find the ink the correct ink, which colored the tassel here. Um, so they didn't use the blue. Rather than use the wrong ink, they, used the, uh, they didn't use blue at all. But actually, they've now found the snail that creates this blue ink. And, uh, and I've seen these snails in the Temple Institute in Jerusalem, and now they can make the, the blue tassel. So sometimes you see now Jews wearing the blue tassel with their... Uh, Pressures. You will have these tassels to look at, and so you will remember all the commands of the Lord that you may obey them and not prostitute yourselves by going after the lusts of your own hearts and eyes. Then you will remember to obey my commands and will be consecrated to your God. And that's in Numbers 15 37 to 40. So there, there is a reminder of the commands of God. It is scriptural for them to be wearing them. Now, what about uh, Jews who have ringlets? Is that scriptural? Well, yes, it is. It's, do not, Leviticus 19, 27 says, do not cut the hair at the sides of your head or clip off the edges of your beard. So it is scriptural for Jews to have tass uh, to have ringlets or hair that has been cut. Really important that we respect that. Separate kitchens. Bring the best of the first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord your God. And I'm talking about sorry, separate kitchens and separate utensils. I'm sorry, I should have explained this. 
often in Jewish homes, they're, 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 there are separate utensils for meat and milk. Um, some restaurants, certainly in Israel, you see, and uh, probably in other parts of the world as well, you have uh, restaurants where a, there is a restaurant that only serves milk products and a restaurant that only serves meat products. And um, some uh, uh, communities of Jews throughout the world have a, 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 a com commands by the rabbinic uh, leaders that say that if you have meat for lunch, then you can only eat a, a Mars bar or a chocolate two hours after your meal or four hours or six hours after your meal because they don't want to you the command uh, not to eat milk and meat is is scriptural so yes it is scriptural it says it's in exodus 23 19 it says do not cook a young goat in its mother's milk so what about clean and unclean food what about this question of pork or shellfish i don't eat pork or shellfish based on the commands that god gives us because pork and shellfish is not um considered food in scripture but this is what god says about it he says the lord said to moses say to the israelites do not eat any of the fat of cattle sheep or goats the fat of an animal found dead or torn by wild animals may be used for any other purpose but you must not eat it anyone who eats the fat of an animal from which is an offering by fire is made to the lord must be cut off from his people and wh wherever you live you must not eat the blood of any bird or animal if anyone eats blood that person will be cut off and the list of full foods that uh, the, the full list of foods that you can eat that's cloven hoof food the animals that chew the cud etc are in leviticus 7 22 to 27 uh, and leviticus 11 you'll get the full list of foods because we're told pork shellfish and other things are not considered food. And certainly we mustn't eat blood. Um, and Paul actually tells us not to eat blood as well. He, he, because he's a pharisaical teacher. He's not, he didn't do away with the Torah. He actually taught us to keep the Torah. And he says you shouldn't eat blood. So, you know, black pudding should not be eaten. And, he, and, and, and we see it in the Acts 15.20. That the that we shouldn't eat blood paul makes that very very clear and in acts 15 29 and in acts 21 25 so what about head coverings what about the yamal cars that we see the the kippers um that we see jewish men wearing uh, kippers are they is that scriptural well, they refer to as yamal cars or skull caps or kippers or simply known as a kipper. Um, the wearing of the kipper is not scriptural, though, but it is a sign of humility for men, acknowledging what's above God. That's why they wear it. Um, so it's not a scriptural precept. Um, and, and today, Jews in, in Israel wear kippers uh, all the time. But it is something that we should respect, although it's not scriptural. Now, I just want to mention something about the synagogue um, where Jews worship. There is no temple now since 70 AD. So we see within Jewish communities always there are synagogues, which are like uh, churches. We actually copied the idea of, of our place of worship originally from the synagogue. And we met in small groups or in community centers type situations. But when paganism in the fourth century uh, began to take over our faith, then, then we started to build churches and places of worship sim in similar architectural style to the Babylonians. But so that's a different story. But let's have a look at this, this, this um, synagogue. It means simply meeting or assembly. The Hebrew expression of the word is Beit HaKnesset, meaning house of assembly. So it's an assembly of people. It was not and today is still not a place that is in any way replaced the practices of the temple. So they're not a, then synagogues are not places of sacrifice. 
They are places of meeting together. The synagogue as an institution was developed in the second temple era after the destruction of the temple synagogue as it is today. And um, wherever the Jewish community are and wherever they were scattered to, they built synagogues. Interestingly, and I just want to mention this. Uh, uh, interestingly, in the first century, when we when the uh, gospel writers were writing, we see that that 50 percent of the leaders of the synagogues in, in, in Israel were women, women leaders in the synagogue. So um, it, the synagogue was an interesting place because men and women did mix. And it was only up until the sixth century that there was a division between men and women in the synagogues. And the pattern of the synagogue uh, was carried through into the uh, Christian church and later into the mosque. Um, but, but things have changed that uh, completely since uh, it, that first happened. Now, I, I know I was going to hold you for about an hour, and I hope that you don't quite go and make a cup of tea yet, because I've got some interesting things just to tell you about regarding the identity of the Jewish people. There has always been an effort to try and remove the identity of the Jewish people. Their identity as, as, as servants of God were to teach about the Sabbath, and the appointed times, the feasts of God from Passover through to Tabernacles. And there have been efforts always throughout the world to try and get to get them to leave those things and to join or assimilate with the pagan world, the Gentile world. And to try and remove their history. There's been a real attempt to try and move their history. Do you remember what I said last week about changing the name from Israel to Palestine? It's an attempt to remove history. And um, in the Inquisition, there was huge attempts to try and stop Jews keeping Sabbath and keeping the feasts. And that's been true for 2000 years right throughout Europe to try and stop Jews keeping Passover and the Sabbath. And believers like me who feel part of the Jewish people because our, our savior is a Jew, then trying to remove that identity. But, but today there is a destruction of, of uh, uh, Jewish religious or Hebrew religious sites in the Middle East by um, the Islamic community who are trying to remove the history of the Jewish people. So Ezekiel's tomb in Hillel, which is in Iraq, which is Babylon, now is an Islamic shrine and they've removed references to Ezekiel. Well, Ezekiel's tomb is Ezekiel's tomb, but but they, they've removed now uh, any references to Ezekiel, and, and it's now an Islamic shrine. Rachel and Joseph's tomb in Nablus is, is now a target of uh, Arab attacks. And um, UNESCO, who, who, are, who, who are given money, I think they're given about £8 million pounds, pounds a year sterling by the UK government, and other governments give to UNESCO, to keep culture, original, historical, architectural, and uh, archaeological culture true, they are now supporting the remaining of the Jewish sites in East Jerusalem. They're supporting their renaming of those sites to remove the history from the Jewish people. It's disgraceful, but this, this is what's happening by UNESCO. The tomb of the patriarchs in Hebron is now been renamed by UNESCO as the Ibrahimi Mosque. Well, it's the tomb of the patriarchs of, of Rachel and, and, and those. And sorry, um, not Rachel, uh, Rebecca, and it, and it's now been called the Imbra, Im, Ibrahimi Mosque, the Temple Mount. Where the, where the holy temple was, is now renamed Haram al-Sharif. So it's now removed the history even of the two temples of Jerusalem, the first and the second temple. And then the tomb of Rachel um, is now called Bilah ibn Rabbah, 
now claimed as a an Islamic site. But the truth of it is that no one can remove what God says about the Jewish people being chosen, being God's treasured possession, being his servant, being his firstborn son, being the apple of his eye. No one can remove that. And, uh, and the, the, the inheritance of the Jewish people to be all those things to God, but also to live on the land that God gave them for a, an everlasting covenant, that can never be removed because God will have his way. He will restore the fortunes of Judah. He will restore the Jewish people back to their own land. And he will uh, uh, make uh, it absolutely, absolutely clear to the world that through his redemption, he has chosen them. So that's the end of uh, module two. And I hope you've enjoyed that. I, I, I love this module because it just reinforces everything that God says about the Jewish people. Now, next week, we're going to look at the, uh, the 12 tribes of Israel, and we're going to look at the three diasporas and where Jews went. And we're going to look at um, a material and historic fact about where Jews went from Israel after 70 AD, but also some of the uh, places they went before in, the, in the first and second diaspora as well. So I look forward to next week. I hope you uh, have enjoyed this evening. Uh, and I hope you enjoy next week as well. And um, uh, before I say goodnight, I just want to mention that I'm here again tomorrow night at seven o'clock, uh, carrying on with the Holocaust teaching. And, uh, and and if you would like to join me, I'd love to see you, or perhaps you see me. I don't know how this works, but um, uh, I look forward to that. So for this evening, thank you for watching. Don't forget to share the uh, Zagev's um, uh, presentation uh, with the uh, Israel's Independence Day at two o'clock in the morning through Zoom. If you want to get onto that, email me and I'll send you the details. Um, so I want to say, Lila Toff, uh, God bless you and good night from Wales. <laughs>